I would uh, like to spend the next uh, 40, 50 minutes with you talking about the problems of congenital malformations of the middle ear. You know, these malformations offer an interesting challenge to the otologist, both from the standpoint of diagnosis as well as the standpoint of surgical attainment. To begin with, many of these cases have, first of all, a multiplicity of deformities. Very seldom do you run into a case that has only one congenital deformity in the middle ear. Most of them are bilateral, although occasionally we'll have a unilateral malformation. Now, the, the challenge to the otologist, of course, is to uh, realize that there may be many more than one, just one deformity in the middle ear, and therefore, as he approaches these cases surgically, he has two decisions to make. Has he discovered all the malformations and corrected them, if possible? And secondly, he must constantly revise his thinking as to what is the best type of reconstruction to employ in these cases. Now, these patients usually come in uh, as children if they're bilateral, often as adults if they're unilateral. We don't like to consider surgery on these congenital malformations in children much under four years of age or five years of age, but we do like to operate at least one ear of the bilateral case prior to their starting school so that they can get rid of their hearing aid. When you examine them, of course, you find a perfectly normal eardrum and no external appearances of any otologic deformity, providing, of course, the problems are in the middle ear. The diagnosis, of course, is readily, readily established because you have these wide bone air gaps, usually, with a relatively normal bone conduction, a flat type of air conduction loss of 50, 55, even 60 uh, decibels. Speech discrimination, of course, is always good because they are strictly conductive losses. I think it's extremely important, of course, to confirm these audiometric tests with uh, tuning forks especially in the unilateral case. This helps uh, you uh, overlooking the possibility of a sensory neural loss in a unilateral case. More recently, as polytomography has become available, we're uh, more inclined, of course, to do polytome studies on all of these suspected congenital cases prior to surgery. In this way, we can often anticipate to some degree what we may encounter. Now, if a child has a bilateral deformity and you operate one case at four or five or six years of age or one ear at that age, one can delay ear surgery on the other ear, of course, until a later date. Now then, when we are in these cases and you realize the deformity is such that you would jeopardize the facial nerve or this child's sensory neural elements in the inner ear, don't be hesitant to back out. You can always back out and go in later. And in those cases that cannot be constructed through the convention, reconstructed through the conventional approach, keep in mind that there is still a place for the fenestration procedure in cases that cannot be corrected by the middle ear approach. Uh, this, as far as I know, is about the only indication for fenestration surgery today. Uh, we certainly have no need for fenestration anymore in the areas of otosclerosis. I do feel, however, we shouldn't do a fenestration on a child. We should wait until they're an adult. They can make up their own mind then about the possibility of having fenestration surgery for their hearing loss and wear their hearing aid in the meantime. Now, this first case is exceedingly interesting. It's a unilateral conductive loss of congenital origin in an adult. And uh, as I open the ear, and as you'll see in a moment, uh, this particular case is unique in that it has a fusion of bone between the long process, the incus, and the area of the posterior bony ear canal wall. It's the only such case in a rather large series of congenital middle ear deformities that I have found uh, with this particular type of pathology. As we raise up the skin flap, in this case, you will notice immediately a rather odd deformity in that the corda tympani nerve is rather enlarged over its normal size 
but oddly and interestingly enough, the Incas is fused by a bony growth extending to the posterior uh, ear canal wall area. You can see that rather large chunk of bone uh, which is causing fixation of the ossicles. Now, we're severing the corda tympani nerve in this case to simply get it out of the way to get better visualization of this rather large mass of bone, which is obviously fixing that incus. You can see how firmly it is fixed. This is a rather an unusual congenital deformity, one that I have never seen before. And so we take a drill and we proceed to uh, move this bone with this small little Kerr drill. And this is just, of course, external to the descending portion of the facial. I can't see the stapes, I cannot see the stapedius tendon, all of which seems to have been replaced pretty much by this mass of bone. This particular problem is uh, rather unique, and you'll notice that I can't differentiate at all now between the inferior portion of the incus and the stapes head. And so in essence, we're continuing to just remove this solid mass of bone now. No apparent joint space that I can determine as yet as we separate this growth or rather as we separate this congenital deformity. Now you'll see at that moment, it did break loose, and now we have movement of the incus and movement of the malleus, which you can see the eardrum just moving. Taking my caret now, we remove a little more of this bone externally on the ear canal. I'm slipping a little celastic material in there in order to prevent regrowth or refixation of the, of the bone. And now you can see the completed procedure. You can see the movement of the stapedial, uh, the stapes and the incus. And you'll notice that there's no uh, movement in the joint itself. It's a completely fixed joint. So we have the stapes moving. We see the round window reflex. And that then uh, in essence, completes the, the operation. Let's say of all the congenital deformities we've had the opportunity to observe, I believe this is the first time I've ever seen a, a, a congenital fusion of that nature between the incus and the posterior bony canal wall. The round window niche there looks a little odd. So there's our movement with round window reflex below. This patient was down about uh, 55 decibels in that ear with essentially normal bone conduction. We're simply replacing the flap of the ear canal skin and filling it with the ointment to hold the flap back. Now this second case is a case, again, of an adult, a bilateral conductive loss. And it's rather interesting in that the ear that you will see in a moment as I open it up will show you that there's never been a neck of the stapes or a head of the stapes. Uh, there's only the arch. And yet the incus is perfectly normal and the lenticular process is perfectly normal. And so there was discontinuity between the lenticular process and the stapes because there was no neck, head, uh, or capitulum. Now we've raised up the skin flap on this second case. And uh, as we um, observe it, uh, we immediately see that there's no connection really between the incus and the stapes. So we have here a congenital absence of the capitulum of the stapes. There's no incostapedial joint. You can see how smooth the surface of the arch is as there's only the arch and no neck, no head. Notice, too, how nicely the stapes footplate moves and the annular ligament around the 
Stapes foot plate, normal mobility of the Incas, and normal mobility of the Malleus. Now at this point, we have several alternatives. One could freshen up the head of the stapes or the arch area there and put in a bone chip. But I personally elected to carefully measure the distance between that foot plate and the top of the incus and then just take off the mucosa over the foot plate area to freshen it up and then took a double wire loop because it has a little more broadness to its base and set it in on the incus on the foot plate and crimped it. Now that has to be a very accurate measurement for obvious reasons. And now you can see the movement of the incus and here is the movement then of the stapes foot plate. Uh, this patient, uh, again, closed the bone air gap and again represented a total ossicular discontinuity with a 55 or 60 decibel bone air gap with no normal bone function, bone conduction. We're putting our flap back now and again putting in the ointment to hold the skin flap in position. This ointment liquefies and comes out the next day on the dressing. This next patient is a child about uh, six years of age, a bilateral conductive loss of the type we've described. And in this particular patient, uh, it turned out to have a fixation of the malleus head with a perfectly normal stapes. And in this case, uh, we simply took off the head and neck of the, of the malleus and repositioned it on top of the normal stapes capitulum, having removed, of course, the incus. You'll notice that as we palpate this, uh, we have here a fixed malleus. And as we raise up the flap, we see a perfectly normal middle ear appearance here with a normal incus, a normal incostapedial joint, stapedius tendon. But there seems to be fixation. It doesn't move freely. And yet you see a blue foot plate, a good ligament around that plate. And so now we're getting movement of the stapes. So it is a perfectly normal stapes. The reason it gives the feeling of being fixed is because apparently the other ossicles are not as free as they should be. So we can tell more about this after we've disarticulated the incostapedial joint. Notice the malleus is obviously firmly fixed and probably with a fusion to the incus so that you have fixation of both the malleus and the incus. There's the malleus. Notice how firm it is. <coughs> as we touch it. Now we'll separate the joint using the counter pull of the stapedius tendon and elevating at the same time because we don't want to inadvertently mobilize or depress that plate. And the minute we've released it, you see we have a lot more movement of the stapes. So this patient has a perfectly normal stapes. And the problem then is due to fixation of the malleus. I always like to see the movement of that ligament around the stapes foot plate in normal cases. Here we are then separating the inco malleolar joint and getting ready to rotate and remove out of its normal position the incus. Sometimes these hang up a little bit just as this one did. You have to rotate it around in order to get the short process to follow and thereby be able to get out the incus. Now we can again see the anterior portion of that foot plate much better now if the ink is out of position. And we're just uh, freshening up the edges of that capitulum a bit. See the normal movement of that ligament. 
Now we'll separate the head and neck of the malleus with the little nipper. And it's always advisable, of course, to remove that malleus head rather than attempting to just leave it because it'll almost invariably refix. So therefore, having separated, we're now in a position to remove the malleus head. And because of the attachment of the anterior tendon there uh, and the ligaments, uh, sometimes this head is a little difficult to get separated from the epitympanic wall, both superiorly and anteriorly. So we then lift out this head. Now we have several possibilities. We could do a repositioning of the incus, or we could use this malleus head, which we elected to do in this case, to put over the top of that freshened up head of the stapes. The other alternative, of course, would be to go ahead and do a stapedectomy and put an IRP or an incus replacement prosthesis from the malleus to this oval window. But we don't like to open up the vestibule unless we absolutely need to because of the hazard to the inner ear and the development of a sensory neural loss. So we put a little gel foam around uh, to help stabilize the malleus head. We sit it on top of the stapes and then put in a little more gel foam. These are just small pledgets of gel foam. And they kind of swell up then and kind of help hold that into position. Very important to keep it separated widely from the posterior bony canal wall because we don't want to get fusion at that point. And so now we're ready to place the skin flap back into its normal position. This time I always like to take a little suction and uh, tip and kind of suck the air out of the middle ear to collapse that eardrum. Now you can see the movement of the malleus. Right there is the area of the malleus head now over the stapes. And we'll put a little gel foam in and just put a little added pressure right over that in order to get firm fixation and attachment between the eardrum uh, undersurface and that malleus head. And we fill up the ear canal with gel foam, leave it in for a week or so. The ointment, of course, will liquefy. Now the next case, uh, the fourth case in our series that we're presenting for you is uh, again a child, a bilateral conductive loss, about five or six years of age. Uh, and uh, in this case, there was a fixed incus with a deformed stapes, but a normal malleus. And so in this case, we removed, of course, the uh, deformed uh, stapes together with its foot plate. We took out the a fixed incus and placed an IRP between the normal malleus handle and the oval window. Now this uh, fourth case is a case of a fixed incus with a deformed stapes. And we placed an incus replacement prosthesis from the malleus to the oval window after doing a stapedectomy. So we have here a fixed incus, and you'll notice that as we palpate the malleus, the malleus is perfectly mobile. But as we look at that incus, we're not getting any movement of the incus, even though we're palpating and moving the malleus. So this is a case of, a rather unusual case, of purely a fixed incus. Now, as we get a feel after a while, you, you'll get the sensation of when you have a normal moving incus, because even with a, uh, a fixed incus, you'll get a little movement of the long process. So we separate this then from the malleus and again uh, remove the, the incus by rotating it up and rotating it out in order to get the short... Uh, process to come along with it. And notice that this patient has this deformed stapes. That's why we didn't go ahead and separate the joint. There wasn't anything to separate, really. And we'll look at this in a moment so you can see it a little better. Here's all there was to the stapes, just a congenital deformity of the 
stapes, very little left to it, and the uh, deformed incus, which was fused uh, in the area of the epitympanum. Now we can see the facial nerve uh, to your left. You can see uh, the foot plate area there, which actually seems to be fixed, although I can't tell at that moment. Here is the malleus moving again. Below is inferiorly there is the round window area. Now we're separating the periosteum from the posterior portion of the malleus. We use a sharp needle to do that, sharp rosin needle. And we slide over the anterior part of the malleus, separating it from the eardrum. It's very important to get under the periosteum with this maneuver, and I use a small suction tip in my left hand in order to act as a retractor as well. Here we are putting in the wire and rotating it around. Now we'll partially close it with a couple little hooks on that malleus. Now we're proceeding to fracture through the foot plate with a sharp little needle. And we'll remove the foot plate, exposing for the first time the vestibule and the paralymphatic fluid. And we slip that into position, taking care to have it at the right length, which is about five and three quarters millimeters as an average. And we tighten up that wire on the malleus at that point. And having gotten it tightened up, now we're in a position to center that wire loop in the oval window and then stabilize it there with very small pledgets of, of gel foam. These give uh, very satisfactory results, and uh, I always think the Incus replacement prosthesis is certainly the most positive prosthesis that we can use uh, as far as a Incus substitute is concerned to run it from the malleus to the oval window. Now the fifth case uh, is an adult who, uh, interestingly enough, bilateral uh, hearing loss, who'd gone all these years, I think about 30 years or so, wearing a hearing aid. And as we open up this case, you'll notice that there was a uh, deformed uh, incus uh, with a rather large dehiscence of the facial nerve. As a matter of fact, you'll see that it's a bifurcate facial. These are not... Uh, too common, and yet they're not rare. And if you're not watching for them, uh, you can certainly get in serious trouble with the bifurcate facial. So in this case, I proceeded to remove the incus and put an IRP from the malleus handle to the oval window, and you'll see the bifurcate facial. This, uh, we'll find, is a deformed incus which has also below it a, a dehiscent facial nerve. You'll see it's a deformed long process, the incus lying right on the facial nerve, which also has a rather large dehiscence in it. And uh, you'll notice movement there of a mass uh, in the area of the stapes uh, region. There's the stapes, and you'll see that it moves when we touch it but it's certainly a deformed stapes, and they, they, there's no definite head of that stapes. The top of the arch is about level with the palmatory and uh, that facial nerve. So we're just clipping uh, through that long process, which is just fibrous tissue with a little scissors. And we'll go ahead now and raise out and rotate around again this deformed incus, which uh, as you can see, we're certainly in the wrong position and uh, lying right on the dehiscent facial nerve. And here again, you can see the deformed incus with the shortened deformed long process. There's the facial nerve. Here is the moving uh, stapes, and you'll see the um, mass that's a little difficult to identify. There seems to be a strand of tissue running along there, inferiorly, lying over the promontory. We have a, a perfectly mobile uh, malleus, 
And so I elected again to do a stapedectomy and put a wire from the malleus down to the oval window area and to do a stapedectomy on this case, even though there was a mobile um, stapes and stapes foot plate. Here we are swinging the wire into position over the malleus uh, handle with two hooks, one stabilizing and the other one to close it partially. We don't like to close it too tight at this point, only partially so we can place it down in a position to be sure it's the right length. Uh, again, about five and three quarters is an average for a case of this type. So here we are trying to evaluate the stapes a little more and you'll see as I'm checking it out a bit, it tends to mobilize and actually became free anteriorly. And so we'll go ahead and take out this stapes by going in anteriorly and elevating uh, the anterior segment first. And uh, now you can begin to look down into the vestibule. And as we do, uh, we'll again uh, go to work on this posterior segment. But this little strand in fairly there bothers me a lot because this might be a bifurcate facial with a complete exposure of the inferior uh, segment there, which is lying uh, on, on the promontory and completely free of any bone around it, of course. So we're moving that pretty carefully, not wanting to put too much of a stretch on that piece of strand here even though the floping canal appears to be in its normal position. Uh, we have a little dehiscence in that floping canal superiorly. So we swing the wire around in the position and uh, go ahead and tighten it by stabilizing it with a little alligator forceps. And we put the gel foam uh, into the oval window, again to stabilize the loop in the center of the oval window area. I suppose this might have been a bifurcate facial with the small segment inferiorly and the larger segment still running in the fallopian canal. You see movement of the wire there as we move the malleus and we put the skin flap back. After filling this with this ointment, uh, as I say, this liquefies in four to six hours and comes out on a head dressing the next morning and the patient goes home. But I was happy to see, of course, the eye movement uh, perfectly normal, the lip movement perfectly normal, and the nares moving perfectly all right on that side. Now the sixth case that you'll see uh, is a patient with bilateral otosclerosis, a young adult, classical case for stapes surgery. And as we open up the case, you'll notice a huge facial dehiscence, so that the facial is actually lying on the cura of the stapes. In this particular case, we were fortunate in that as we removed the stapes superstructure, the underlying foot plate was found to be very thin and very bluish, and therefore I was able to fragment the plate and uh, place a wire loop from the incus to the fragmented plate. We found this to be a very satisfactory procedure because we don't need to remove the foot plate, and in these cases, the incidence of sensory neural loss seems to be much greater, uh, much less, as a matter of fact, than it is uh, if one does a total stapedectomy. And so you'll see uh, this case unfold. Now this uh, next case is an exposed overhanging facial in a case of otosclerosis, and this isn't too uncommon. You can see the fixed stapes. We've separated the joint We've clipped off the uh, area of the stapedius tendon, but doing it carefully there because we don't want to disturb that facial. And you'll see a huge facial dehiscence lying completely down on the stapes cura. That's all dehiscent there, perfectly normal stape, uh, facial nerve, but no bone over the entire length of the fallopian canal. So we separate the stapedius tendon, being careful not to get your scissors too far down, and uh, go ahead and crack out this superstructure. And you can see now that facial is lying practically on the promontory with just a little slit there. 
That makes your incus fairly short, of course. So in a case like this, we go ahead and measure. And if it doesn't look feasible, we take the incus out and put in an IRP, that is the wire from the malleus to the oval window. But in this case, it looked as though we could get away with a wire to the incus. I'm just going to fragment this case simply because my needle there went through very nicely. You can see the little fragmented plate there a bit. You can see it's all fragmented. And in this situation, then, we we'll, uh, won't need to do a stapedectomy. We'll just put in the single wire loop, place it over the incus, and crimp it. Now, we add about an extra quarter of a millimeter to a wire loop in a fragmented case where we normally would add a, a quarter, we add a half because your fragments drop a little bit. We don't put gel foam in, just the normal blood clot to close it again. These are very satisfactory cases because we don't see the sensory neural losses as often. Now the next patient has a congenital absence of the stapes and oval window. Uh, there was, uh, the facial nerve was uh, visible inferior to the stapes along, running along the promontory area. Now, this type of case, you'll see that we back out of. We don't complete the case. And I might say, don't hesitate to back out of these cases when you run into them uh, uh, of this severity. It's this type of case, too, the polytomography helps us a lot on if you have an opportunity to take them preoperatively in these congenital cases. Now this case is a congenital absence of the stapes and the oval window. Uh, keep in mind again uh, all these cases are 55, 60 decibel losses. Notice the bifurcate facial with the facial nerve inferiorly again over the promontory the normal position of the fallopian canal to your left or superiorly, the, the uh, bifurcate facial inferiorly lying over the promontory area. There's the bifurcate facial. It's within its bony capsule except right there. There's the facial exposed. So there's a dehiscence in that inferior portion of the bifurcate facial. Now you'll notice that as we touch that incus, it seems to almost be too movable, too freely movable. Touching the malleus there, and moves it very well. And then as we look up in this area, you can actually see a little bit of a dehiscent facial almost up in the superior anterior portion. You see that bifurcation there very nicely. Now we touch this, you see there's uh, way too much mobility. And you can see him pass my hook right underneath that deformed stapes, so there's no cura, no attachment to anything down below. So it's a congenital deformity of the stapes. And often when you have one type of deformity, you'll find there's several other deformities in the same ear. So we'll uh, separate this joint a little bit. Always leave your stapedius tendon uh, intact until you've got your joint separated in order to get the counter pull of the stapedius tendon. Then we'll cut the tendon and raise out this, what amounts to a very immature, poorly developed congenital deformity of the stapes cura. They were never attached to the foot plate. Now, as we look at this foot plate, it's obviously very hard, and there's no distinct margins around it. Now, these are usually bilateral cases. Most of them are usually in children. This, uh, that we are exploring these ears, this child was about seven years old, with perfectly normal bone conduction. So we backed out of this case. We'll get some polytomes, uh, and later on, uh, if everything else is normal, we might go in and drill it out again, or go to a fenestration. Now the eighth case that I'll show you in this series is a congenital absence of the incus, a congenital absence of the stapes, and a congenital absence of the oval window. 
you will also notice a deformity of the facial, a misplaced facial nerve. And again, you'll notice that we back out, knowing that later in this child's life, uh, it'll still have the opportunity of having a fenestration procedure with excellent opportunity of getting a good result. Now, as we raise up this flap, we'll see that, uh, again, another uh, congenital uh, deformity, extensive one. There's a complete absence of the incus. There's complete absence of the stapes. There's complete absence of any oval window demarcation. The fallopian canal seems to be reasonably in its normal position. Here's the round window. So here's a case, then, in essence, of congenital absence of the incus, congenital absence of the stapes. Here we're just taking some membrane off of the area where we might expect the foot plate to be. But again, we'll uh, back out of this case and do the same as we did on the last one, get polytomography studies before we get brave with the idea of going into that with a drill. And never go into those with a drill if there's no clear mark demarcation indicating a foot plate. You never know what you've got on the other side. Now, these cases are ideal, of course, for fenestration later on. And that's still the indication for fenestration is some of these congenital deformities. They're ideal because the bone conduction is perfectly normal, right across the zero line, so to speak, with a bone air gap of 50, 55 decibels. So uh, fenestration doesn't need to be a lost art, but we wouldn't do that until these kiddos are uh, old enough. They're late teens or 20s to make that decision. Now the ninth case is a child, uh, seven years of age, bilateral conductive loss that has a typical bifurcate facial, which is not encased in bone either superiorly or inferiorly. This is a little unusual. Uh, many of your bifurcates will uh, be exposed on one side or the other, but it's seldom to have complete exposed bifurcates both above and below. In this uh, little girl, uh, I uh, was able to uh, get a get very good view of the foot plate, but not sufficient to see the margins. And as you'll see, we uh, found it to be very hard. I tried to drill, but uh, would not, uh, did not find it feasible to go ahead and jeopardize the child's hearing. And I think in these bifurcated cases, uh, one isn't able to see the margins of the foot plate too well, and therefore many of them actually may well have a congenital absence, literally absent uh, oval window area. Now, as we elevate this flap, and uh, you'll see the, again, a, some deformities. You can see a very freely movable stapes, a normal moving incus, and a normal malleus movement. But we have no round window reflex. If you look in fairly to your left, no round window reflex. We look down into that old window area, there's some mass down in there which doesn't look quite normal. You'll notice there's a congenital absence of the cardiotympany nerve in this case. And there's hypermobility of that stapes, and it obviously, uh, like a, a previous case, is not attached to its foot plate. You'll notice the curve there of the fallopian canal as it comes around. It seems to be intact, as near as we can tell. So we'll go ahead and sever the little speedius tendon and uh, separate the joint a bit. And we'll remove carefully the stapes uh, superstructure. There are some adhesions down in uh, there. It's a little hard to see the foot plate. But in a congenital case, always be careful of, quote, adhesions, end quote, because it could be other things. So you'll see this anterior process is round on the end and uh, never was attached. Note how long this posterior crus of that stapes superstructure arch is. So it was quite long and a very short anterior crus. Here's the two anterior and posterior crura. Now we'll straighten up 
some of these little adhesions and uh, begin to look at this foot plate a bit. And as we do immediately, we'll see here's the area of the fallopian canal, but uh, here's something soft superiorly and something soft inferiorly over the promontory area. Well, if we look at it closer, there's the normal area of the fallopian canal. Here's the bifurcate facial with the two divisions exposed. There's the inferior portion of the bifurcate there, and the other is the superior portion. Now, when I palpate that foot plate, it's very hard, but uh, it did seem to be a little uh, bluish, and so I thought, well, I'll take a drill and try it. We're measuring now up to the Incas, so we put in our, notice how hard that is, just like cement, it, it felt hard, it felt unusually hard, and of course, because of the overlying bifurcate facial, I couldn't see any demarcation. So I took my drill and I uh, drilled just a little bit on it, but immediately I could tell, again, it was a very hard bone, deep, and were we able to get our bifurcate facial out of the way, we could see there's no demarcation. So we have no oval window demarcation. And again, we back out, ideal case for fenestration later on, if we so decide. Now this 10th case uh, takes us into a little different category as we begin to show you some of the deformities that are vascular in nature. Uh, this patient had typical otosclerosis, both ears, uh, was an adult about 35 years of age, uh, and as I opened up the ear, I found a st pulsating stapedial artery. Now these stapedial arteries uh, may be either patent arteries or non-patent. They may be small fragments of, ar of artery remnant, or they may be large and pulsating, as in the case you will see very shortly. Uh, oddly enough, there was no pulsating tinnitus in this case, although you'll see it was a very large stapedial artery. We were able to get out the posterior part of the foot plate, perfectly all right, and the patient closed the bone air gap afterward. Now, this is an interesting situation. It's a patient who has otosclerosis, but notice the pulsating stapedial artery. Your facial nerve is there, and uh, here is the pulsation. You can see the capillaries in the wall of that vessel. Uh, superiorly, or to your left, is the facial nerve as the stapedial artery dives into that area. The stapedial artery pulsating over the palmatory area as it dives into the palmatory region at that point. There's the patent stapedial artery. So we proceeded here to do our stapedectomy, but we only removed the posterior half of the plate. We're measuring down to get the length for our wire. And we'll slip out the posterior part of the fixed foot plate and put our wire posteriorly in order not to have to disturb that rather large pulsating stapedial artery. Now you can see the pulsation clearly. You can see the little anterior uh, foot plate area there. We're putting in our gel foam carefully over that pulsating stapedial artery and up over the facial nerve. We'll depress it a little bit posteriorly and we'll make our wire a little longer. Instead of adding a quarter, we'll add to a half here because it's going to be extending posteriorly a bit. So in goes our wire onto this incus. We'll crimp it in such a fashion. And we'll scoot it a little posteriorly now to keep it away from that pulsating artery. This patient, interestingly enough, closed the bone air gap, got a very nice result. Put the flap back, and that concludes uh, this case. Now, the next patient is a patient who came in with pulsating tinnitus. Very severe, an adult about 45 years of age, and her only complaint was pulsating tinnitus, no hearing loss. And as we examined the eardrum, we were able to see a pulsating mass somewhat resembling a, a glomus jugulary tumor. And so we opened this case under local anesthesia. Uh, this was done about 10 years ago. Of course, this case would be handled differently today. 
And so you'll see this case get the otologic surgeon into a bit of difficulty. Now this last case is um, a uh, interesting one. Here's an eardrum, but there's a mass on that drum, and this patient's main complaint was tinnitus, pulsating tinnitus. She was about 35 years of age and had it for about four or five years, progressively getting a little worse. You can see the highlights there, the pulsation. Well, we thought it was a glomus of the middle ear, and this case was done about 1962. So um, we were unaware of some of the other problems we could have here at the time, and so under a local anesthetic, I made the first incision rather far anterior, uh, rather far anteriorly, and we come around superiorly. Uh, here it's inferior. This is uh, going rather far inferiorly and removing the posterior area of the flap and the superior area. To your right is the superior area of the ear canal. To your left is the inferior area. And we'll enter this ear very carefully uh, because we expected to find a glomus uh, tumor. And as we open it up, we can see a perfectly normal incus. You can see this little mass posteriorly and inferiorly. And on the promontory. So here we are watch, looking at this kind of a mass in this area. Notice it has a mulberry appearance. And uh, I gained a little more exposure here inferiorly yet to get a little better look. And now you can see the pulsation quite clearly with that mulberry mass overlying the promontory. Well, I'd never seen anything quite like this before at that time. And uh, I couldn't imagine what that mulberry tissue might be. Well, um, I remember in medical school, they told me when in doubt about tissue, you biopsy it. And you'll notice this pulsation there uh, anteriorly, uh, which is quite pronounced. And that's rather soft tissue there. And so I spread it far to get as much exposure as I could. I take a small little biopsy forceps to get some of that mulberry tissue, and you can see what happened. Now then, uh, obviously, it was necessary to stop all this hemorrhage, which is coming out the ear canal and down over the sheets and on my ankles and whatnot. And so I packed the ear and was able to stop this marked hemorrhage. I just couldn't control it with any of the suction tips I had available. And so I'd put the pack back in and I'd wait again a few minutes more. And then I'd carefully remove it a little after waiting number of minutes, hoping maybe that it might clot, but immediately again, it just came out very, very fast. As you can see, I couldn't control it at all with the largest suction tips I had. And so, again, it became perfectly apparent I would have to pack the ear. And we repeated this for about 45 minutes or so. The anesthetic was beginning to wear off, and so I uh, concluded the case by simply putting in the pack putting on a head dressing and sending the patient uh, downstairs because it's perfectly apparent to whatever this was, I wasn't going to be able to control it. Well, after sending the patient on down to the room, because in those days there was no recovery room, I went in and changed clothes. And uh, when I went down to see this patient with the mastoid dressing on, uh, I uh, asked her how she was feeling. And oddly and earnestly enough, she couldn't speak. She had total aphasia. I noticed, too, that she was paralyzed on the one side. And so I immediately got a pair of scissors and cut off the head dressing and pulled the pack out just enough to get some bleeding and then put it in just enough to stop it without any pressure and put on a head dressing. 
and went to the phone and called a friend who was a neurosurgeon and asked him to come down and see the patient. He happened to be in the hospital. So I suppose it was 10 minutes later when he arrived on the floor and I was telling him the terrible predicament that I'd found myself in. And he said, well, let's go see the patient. So we went in and uh, I said, tell me, how, how do you feel? She said, well, I just feel fine, doctor. And she says, you know, that head noise, that pulsation that's been driving me crazy is gone. It's just absolutely great. And lo and behold, she had no paralysis on that side. Well, of course, we walked out to the hall. The neurosurgeon uh, was, uh, we were discussing the various possibilities. And it was quite apparent I must have been involved with a carotid artery, perhaps a carotid aneurysm, and it certainly seemed logical. And as a result, uh, we tried to figure out what is the best thing to do now with this situation. Well, that night I was leaving for Florida, and that's kind of a tough thing for, for the one who's following to take care of the case, but it was a great thing for me uh, because I was president of Triological that year and had to be there for the meeting. And so I told Jim Sheehy, my associate, uh, of the problem and asked Jim if he would go back into the case the next morning and uh, see if he couldn't get things under control. Well, we discussed it, of course, at length with all the associates in our group, and we decided the best thing to do would be to put the patient under hypothermia, which was done. And Jim went in through the mastoid uh, approach, removed the pack, and uh, filled the entire middle ear area with muscle and the mastoid and was able to control this hemorrhage. Uh, put the head dressing on, and interestingly uh, enough, there was no residual whatsoever. Uh, the patient left the hospital in a few days and went on home to her home state. Came back in about three months and just thought that we were the greatest ever. Uh, and interestingly enough, no more head noise, no more pulsation, and perfectly normal hearing. So that's the end of what could have been, indeed, a very tragic occasion. Thank you very kindly for your attention.